Okay, everybody, this is the beginning of our uh, class section about design. Um, a lot of you may be thinking visual design still, even though I've tried to expand your definition. But again, design is not just about how a document looks. It's also a, about a, how a document works. Um, and that's going to be really emphasized in this brief class session. Um, we're going to talk about designing by planning and how planning plays a role in design. We'll talk about setting a goal for every written document, choosing a channel for your document, and outlining documents. Uh, let's start off by talking about design by planning. Uh, you know, the book has this really fun little sketch uh, showing how that showing how artists typically sketch before they um, finish whatever it is that they're drawing or painting. Um, th there's a really cool example of this actually. Um, <clears throat> Many of you are familiar with Vermeer's painting, The Girl with the Pearl Earring. Uh, There's a movie made about it. Um, but, uh, you know, this is a really striking painting for a lot of reasons. Um, one of the most prominent is the difference between light and dark. Um, there's quite a bit of contrast and emphasis, and also there's more about it than just that. It's also the way she's looking over her shoulder, her eyes, the earring, obviously, the color of her lips, the the color of her um, uh uh, what she's wearing on her head. There are a lot of things about this painting that make it so fascinating and beautiful to us. But what's really interesting that a lot of people don't know about this painting, and I'm not an art history major, this is just something I, I happen to find out, is that uh, Vermeer actually painted this before he painted it using a technique called underpainting, which basically involved painting the doc painting it once in just black and white rather than with the colors and then he painted over top of his black and white outline so to speak um the this did a couple of things one is it helped him to sort of pin down the the the, the look of it, that he wanted of everything what her eyes look like what you know the, the the way her head was bending to look over her shoulder the size of the earring that she was wearing and so on like he figured out all that stuff before he bothered adding any color um, and it also emphasizes the contrast between light and dark because it has an, a, a visual effect on the paint that goes over top of it. So light looks lighter and dark looks darker because of this technique called underpainting. Um, what's interesting and important to observe, though, is that because he did this, the essence of his painting was complete before the painting was. Um, you know, he, this is not his actual underpainting. This is done by another artist, but... Uh, it's a reproduction, but but you'll notice that really the whole, almost the entire essence of the painting is captured in this black and white version that he, that uh, was created before the overpainting part occurred. And you know, the color is really important. Um, the color of her skin, her lips, her her, you know, the the scarf she's wearing on her head. Uh, the color of her eyes, like those things are really essential to the painting, obviously, but the essence of the painting is already captured in this black and white version. Um, the reason I'm sharing this is because this is what, uh, this is, this is what it's like when you plan a document ahead of time. I mean, you really, if you've planned a document well, its entire essence is captured before the document is ever complete. And that's the way I want you to think about it, is, is that before you sit down to, to write out a document that you capture its essence first. Once you've captured its essence, then the writing part is actually pretty easy, but also more focused. Um, I've graded a lot of papers in my career that read like brain dumps, where the students essentially kind of pour everything out of their brain onto the keyboard, uh, and then they go to organize it after the fact and then turn it in. And this is a strategy that rarely works well for them. Um, you know, if you can plan out your document before you start the writing, uh, it usually works a lot better. Um, one of the aspects of planning a document is setting the goal. Um, you've seen this slide before. Uh, you know, I said that worthwhile communication is designed for the purpose, the audience, and the medium. I said that those come in order of importance. Well, every document should have a goal. Every every business communication should have a goal or a purpose. It w should have a goal attached to it. Now, the goal is different than the purpose a little bit, and I'm going to explain why. W when we think of goals, we think of purposes. Like, whatever goal I have for the document is the same as the purpose, but I'm going to amend that understanding just a little bit. Because if you go back to my definition of effective writing, it's writing that's used to make decisions. Well, a decision seems like the purpose, right, the outcome. But it involves something else. It's not just about purpose, but a decision is about purpose and audience. 
The reason that matters is because people are the ones who make decisions. It's they're, 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 the document's not making a decision, but the people reading it are. And so when you set a goal for a document, the goal is that the people reading it make a decision. And so so really you're, you're, you're considering this doubly, and, and, and it's true for every communication you have. If you send an email to a friend asking for help moving, then you're going to be considering two things. One, the purpose, which is to talk, tell them about your your need to move. Two is the audience, and that's the friend you're sending the email to. Well, the combination of those lead to a decision, not just one or the other. And so when you think about the goals of a document, when you sit down to design it, um, you are really – the goal is a decision, and the decision is, the decision is a combination of audience and purpose. And so the goal for every communication is a particular decision to be made. And I encourage you to think of, to, to make this hi- as habitual as possible. When you sit down and draft an email, write a memo, whatever, <clears throat> you ask yourself, what is the decision I want to be made based on what I'm writing? And that will help you gain a lot of clarity and help you figure out what's important in the message and what's not. Another part of a well-designed message is is a channel strategy. Um, back to this slide, worthwhile communication is designed for purpose, audience, and medium. The channel p- part of a strategy is all about the medium. The book illustrates five different channels or sort of attributes of every message. You choose a channel that, that um, better put, these aren't channels. These are attributes of every channel. So a channel is the medium, essentially, and these are five attributes of every channel. And and we're going to step through them quickly just to make some observations. Um, The first channel is richness. Uh, You know, um, the the richness of a a, uh, encounter of a communication has to do with the multitude of communication styles used at once. Um, a conversation, for example, has, is more rich than an email because when you communicate with somebody face-to-face in a conversation, they get the benefit of things like nonverbal cues. Um, whereas if you communicate an email, it's very bare and you really only have the words on, on the screen. Um, and so this face-to-face communication is where it gets rich and intimate and you learn a lot about the, um, <clears throat> the message being communicated. Convenience is another one. You know, text messages, I think, are the epitome of convenient communication. I want you to notice, though, that convenience usually comes at a cost. Um, the more convenient a communication, the less energy we tend and the less energy we tend to put into a communication, the less we invest in those communications. You know, that's why text messages and Twitter and even emails are um, often uh, p- poor at communicating or at least poorly used, because the, when the convenience is high, usually the, the, the richness of a communication is low. Um, speed is another thing to consider. Uh, you know, the speed of the communication is the speed at which it goes from you to them. We live in an era when speed is so inconsequential because everything can be so fast, right? You know, um, we don't really live in a time anymore where snail mail, like regular post mail, is, is used for most of our communications. It used to be that way, but it's not anymore. But I want you to stop and think about ways in which speed might serve your purpose. Um, you know, um, this has to do, with, again, with richness and convenience, but uh, there might be value in your communication taking three or four days to arrive versus sending it in an email because it can add weight and significance. Um, you know, there's too much that is lost in the value of something you get immediately. But when you have to wait for something, uh, you tend to value it. We tend to value it more. Waiting, for some reason, gives it importance. And so you might consider a uh, communication uh, channel that, that is actually relatively slow um, because it adds significance or weight or appreciation to what you're communicating. Uh, another thing that's been changing dramatically because of technology is the permanence of our communications. It used to be the case that, uh, you know, the only conversations that weren't, the only communications that weren't permanent were conversations either over the phone or face to face but you know now we have things like snapchat where even though it's 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 a fixed um medium like you know the 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 picture or the words you see on a screen 
a lot of the permanence is gone. And so these things, in fact, Snapchat, right, is a communications channel that is deliberately impermanent, right? It's, it's intentionally left so that um, the messages there go away quickly. Um, I think we undervalue uh, permanence uh, in this, for the same reason we undervalue uh, speed and convenience. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, another thing to, to consider in your communication is do you want this preserved? Do you want this to remain? And uh, you might consider avoiding electronic communications if that's the case. Finally, cost is a big deal. Um, the truth is physical media versus electronic media is substantially more expensive. Um, you know, it's not, it's just kind of an ironic coincidence that, uh, our, that our dollar bills, right, which are um, s still relatively important in our economy, first, they're totally supplanted by electronic me media. I mean, most, the vast majority of dollars are transmitted electronically rather than physically. But the physical manifestations are, I mean, the bills are expensive to print. I mean, look at all the features we have in our bills to make sure that they're not easily uh, counterfeit, counterfeited. And so, you know, cost matters. But again, you know, low cost isn't always the best approach. Sometimes high cost is the right approach. Uh, we just had a conversation with the Grantwell executive team with some brochures that were developed last year, you know, and, and we're trying to decide how well to print them. We can print them. We can just send electronic versions to everybody, or we can print them and staple them, or we can print them and bind them in a really nice way on expensive paper. But the more of those kind of features we add, right, the type of binding, the type of paper, color versus black and white, the more expensive it becomes. But the cost conveys a certain weight or meaning. Um, it has a lot more value. If all of our dollar bills were photocopied, we wouldn't think much of them. They would literally lose their value. But because we spend a lot of money to make these bills nice, um, they feel more substantial to us. And it's true for communications. It's too, it's too easy to ignore the weight and value of a document in your hand that's been well-designed and well-printed. And so remember that there's sort of a trade-off, right? I mean, we have this world of electronic communication, and we have a world of physical communication still. And electronic communication is, is more convenient, it's faster, it's, it's less expensive, but as a result, it's also less permanent and less rich. And this is a trade-off you constantly have to consider when you are conveying something to somebody else who's going to make a decision. And so if the decision is really important, you might consider those, those media that are more rich uh, and probably as a result also more expensive. <clears throat> okay, this is the last item when we're done. We're going to talk about outlining. I'm not going to review the book on outlining because I think it does an excellent job of explaining all the different ways that we need to outline a communication before you write it. Um, like I said, a lot of students tend to do a brain dump and then sort it out. Um, that is one of the that actually is one of the outlining methods that described in the book. But my advice is that you always outline first before you write, especially anything substantial. Um, I'm going to show you one of the really cool consequences that come out of putting in this effort to outline a document first. This is the outline of my presentation that I recorded here. You know, these are the four things that we've talked about up to this point. Um, but that's not actually how I approached this. What I did instead is I outlined, um, without you guys knowing, I outlined the essence of it. So I, so I had, you know, the design by planning, and I talked about Vermeer and underpainting and comparing Vermeer to business documents and then setting the goal. Right, where I sort of outline the process of why goals matter with documents and what a goal actually is, meaning it's a decision. I talked about choosing a channel and then, and then finally outlining. What happens is if you sit down to outline a document, you actually half write it. And then the writing comes so easily. I mean, if I were to take this slide, it would be hard for somebody to write a, say, a memo or maybe a brief instructional document it, outlining what I've an, an instructional document describing what we've covered in this class session but if I gave this to somebody they'd have an easy time writing or at least an easier time the the point is is by being sort of more thorough in my outline I, I, I make the writing of it really simple and some of the biggest documents I've wrote written <laughs> some of the biggest documents I've written have been the result of um, outlining first. I, I outline them and fill in details throughout the outline, and then the book 
or the document just essentially became half written. But as a result of this process, the rest of the writing was dramatically easier. What this does is it captures the essence and completes it before the document is ever complete, just like our Vermeer. And, uh, and that's why outlining is such a valuable tool. And I encourage you to develop this habit. Sit down and outline something every time. And we're going to practice outlining in class so that you can get better at this and see how it works. So I look forward to seeing you all then.